I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying down for the joy of the Lord. Sing it with me, Mama. Good morning. I'm trading my sin. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Magandang magandang gabi mga kapatid sa Yes! Yes Lord! Yes Lord! Yes Lord! Yes Lord! Yes Lord! Yes Lord! Thank you so much Josh! Thank you, thank you so much! God bless you mga kapatid! Ngayong umaga ito, tanghali, umaga, saan makainan doon? We welcome you again to another night or day of We Preach One Facebook page, also sa YouTube po ng Church Seven days a week. Kamusta po kayo dyan, mga kapatid? Comment, comment naman doon. Comment, comment so we know you're watching right now. We are back in Indiana after 11 hours, 11 long hours of driving yesterday. Lunis po, Marcus ngayon, umaga ng mag alas 9, pasado na. And we are so grateful and thankful to the Lord for this opportunity once again. Come to your homes and share to you our Pastor of the Week, featured pastor, Rico Gutierrez. Pastor Rico Gutierrez, Panami Salamu once again for accepting our very humble invitation to play your videos here for the entire week. We are on day number two, and it's interesting that he has a series of Colossians chapter one. Today, he is going here to share to us a, a topic entitled, What Makes Faith in Jesus Great? What Makes Faith in Jesus Great? Based on Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 8, we want to hear Pastor Rico Gutierrez share to us this beautiful text. And Mamadi, prepare your hearts, your minds, not only to receive the Word of God, but also to respond to the beautiful Word of God to be given to us by our dear Pastor Rico this, this morning, evening, afternoon, from Colorado, Pastor Rico Gutierrez. But pray for you, Panginoon, as you listen to this beautiful text. At gabay tayo ng Panginoon as we watch, mag-inspired po tayo kung paano tayo magiging dakila ang ating pananampalataya sa harap pa ng Panginoon. That He will be pleased in our lives. At dalang namin sa Panginoon, mga patid, we will not only receive the Word of God, but also respond to it each and every day. Amen? Amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning po sa mga nalad sa atin. We are on day number two sa atin pong... Uh, we preach one Facebook page with Pastor Rico Gutierrez, and we are so glad, mga kapatid, that you are here with us this morning. Ngayong umagi kita, mga kapatid, let's open with a word of prayer and thank the Lord for what He has done and what He is about to do this morning, evening, afternoon. San man kayo nandoon? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, mula po sa Indiana at sa Colorado. Colorado, God bless you, mga kapatid, as we start our beautiful text time together. Panginoon Diyos, we ask you, Lord God, to be with us now as we receive the word of God through Pastor Rico Gutierrez. Bless him, Panginoon Diyos, as he blesses us, inspires us, edifies those who are weak in their faith, encourages those who are discouraged, and evangelizes those who need salvation. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Mahalo God bless you as you listen to the word of God be preached to us by Pastor Rico Good chair is all the way from them. Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, the book of Colossians. And we will be at um, Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 8. You know, some of the greatest men and women who have ever lived and walked this earth have been followers of Jesus Christ. You know, and we enjoy their legacy. All of the central values and institutions that we cherish here in the Western civilization, whether it's representative democracy or the abolition of slavery, compassion for the weak and the poor, the dignity of uh, and equality of women, education for the young, the rights of the workers for fair pay, healthcare, introduction of hospitals, they are done by Christians uh, in the sixth century, prison reform was really led by followers of Jesus Christ. All of them have their roots in these people who believe in God's word, lived it out, and impacted society. 
And, and we will see this, this vast difference because if you would look at history, the world then was so cruel. I mean, it was sadistic, autocratic, it was filled with slavery, it depreciated the value and the role of women. But Christianity came in and it brought new values and new ethics because we believe that everyone is created equal in the sight of God and um, in the image of God. And that system elevated every society that it penetrated. What makes Christianity remarkable and impactful? I mean, what are the benefits of following Jesus Christ? That is the theme of this paragraph that we are going to look at this afternoon. It's all about what's going on in the lives of these people that have been transformed by the gospel message. Now, if you would look at uh, our section this afternoon, verses 3 to 8, it's six verses. But when you read it in the original language, it's just one very long sentence. <laughs> so it's so interesting because we have, we're categorizing it in six verses, but just one long sentence in the Greek. So let's read that right now. Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 8. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So let's talk about this passage. Paul starts this section by saying, we give thanks to God. Now remember, this letter was written in jail. Paul was in prison in Rome, and anytime anyone in jail starts their letter with the words, we give thanks to God. It's noteworthy, right? I mean, how can you give thanks to God in your circumstances? And that's one of the great features of Paul. Because no matter what's going on in his life personally, no matter what pain or incarceration he's experiencing, and for this matter, you know, what's going on in the church in Colossae, as we've been learning last week, there was a false teaching that was being rampant there, Paul can always find something to thank God for. And that's a good thing, because we noted last week, yes, there were false doctrines. Yes, there were false believers, but there were also real ones, authentic ones. And for those, he says, we give thanks to God. You know, if I only see problems, I'll be called a pessimist. If I only see blessings, I will be called an optimist. But if I see problems and blessings and choose to be thankful for those blessings and not focus on, on, on everything else that's happening, you know, and, and to just learn to be grateful there, I call myself a spiritual realist because, yes, we, we are aware of what's happening around me, but I don't let that define how I thank the Lord. So that's a great feature of Christianity, and definitely Paul was good at that as well. Now, we learned last week that Paul never visited the town of Colossae. He did not start the church there. He, he never met the believers from Colossae face to face. He just heard about them through this guy named Epaphras. And um, he's heard enough from them that he writes to them, and these verses gives us five traits that make their faith in Jesus great. And by the way, this is not just true 
for the believers in Colossae, we can also say these are five traits that every Christian has because of their faith in Jesus, okay? So what are these five traits that make faith in Jesus great? Number one, they are exposed to a great gospel. They are exposed to, the, to a great gospel. We see that at the very end of verse 5 and into verse 6. It says there, which you heard before, look at that, in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard in you the grace of God in truth. So they heard a message. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So once again, just as a review, Epaphras was a citizen of Colossae. He wanted to go hear Paul, so he went 80 miles from Colossae to Ephesus because Paul stayed there for three years. And Epaphras liked what he heard. And Epaphras believed what he has heard, and it transformed his life. So he went back to Colossae, shared the gospel with his family, with his friends, with his neighbors, with whoever. You know, he shared with faith in the people of that town. And because of that, they heard the message, believed in that same message, and a church was born. Now, let me just make a couple notes about that before we keep going. As we have said, this church was started by Epaphras, not the Apostle Paul. And God doesn't always need an apostle to start a church or to get his work done. You know, you can do whatever God tells you to do, whatever God calls you to do. Because a lot of times Christians, when, when they hear God's call in their life, they would say, well, I'm not like, you know, them, you know, like the Apostle Paul or whoever it is who stands up front. I'm, I'm just me. Well, here we are. We see Epaphras was just one of them. He was from Colossae. He heard the news. He heard the good news. And he was used by God to begin this church. And, and that's not the only time this happened. In the New Testament, there's a guy in the Gospels. Uh, he was demon possessed and Jesus delivered him and he begged Jesus, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be your follower. And, and Jesus told him, no, you have to go back and tell your friends and family the great things that God has done for you, how he has showed you compassion. And so this guy went back, shared what Jesus has done for them, and they heard the gospel. And so they were exposed again to the gospel. So that word that Paul used, the word of the truth of the gospel. The word gospel is used 100 times in the New Testament, and 73 times of the 100, it was Paul who used it. Paul loved the word. And by the way, what does the gospel mean? Well, the gospel simply means good news. It's the good news. But sometimes that's where we stop. In our understanding of the gospel. What's the good news exactly? Well, the good news is that Jesus solved man's problem of sin. We cannot solve it. That's the bad news, right? And, and we deserve God's judgment. But Jesus came. And basically, the good news is he solved the problem of sin through his death, burial, and resurrection. That is the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel is our message. We share that message. It's what we do. It's what Christians do. It's what Christians should focus on, center on more than anything else that we do. I mean, we're not all about community uh, outreaches or service, though we do that, right? That's important, but we're more than that. You know, we're, 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 it's more than fellowship. We do that too. That's important too. But it's more than that. It's about the good news that can change people's lives that they need to hear. And that's what we should be all about. The gospel changed Paul's life. 
It turned him from Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. It transformed him from a persecutor of the church to a preacher of this gospel. And consequently, it changed the life of Pastor Epaphras in Philemon from that town of Colossae. And they in turn went back, shared this good news to others, and everyone was changed. So the first step to experiencing a great life in this world is to hear the message, the greatest message in the world, and that's the gospel. Romans 10, 13 to 15 reads, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good news, of good things. So a person, a preacher, uh, get sent out, that preacher preaches, people hear, and that's how the gospel is spread. And this is important because it reminds us that salvation is both a divine work and a human work. God does the saving, man does the sharing. And, and this really brings up an important part of sharing the gospel, that we want to use words when we share the gospel, we need to use words. Jesus did, did not say, go into all the world, period. No, he says, go into all the world and preach the good news. Preach the gospel. You know, tell them how to have a right relationship with God. How to get from heaven to earth in an accurate instruction. That's preaching the gospel. And if Aphras evidently did that. He preached and people heard a great gospel and they were saved. The second trait, they experienced a great Christ. So they received the great gospel, they experienced the great Christ. Once a person hears the message of the gospel, look at what happens in verse 4. Since we heard of your faith. So faith comes by hearing. So, hearing the gospel first, and then faith, faith in Christ. Now, when a person hears the gospel, they either believe it, or they do not believe it. And when you believe it, that's when salvation happens. You experience salvation. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, people hear People believe. But notice something else. Notice that Paul was very specific about the faith that he was referring to. First of all, it was an objective faith. He didn't just say, we've heard your faith, and that's it. No, he said, we've heard your faith in Christ Jesus. And this is very important. And one thing you'll discover that in Colossians, Paul makes a big deal out of Jesus. Why? Well, because these false teachers that we talked about last time, they were trying to take Jesus away from his preeminent position. So Paul keeps putting him back into his rightful place. So it is not just faith. It must be faith in Christ Jesus. Because People these days say things like, well, you've got to have faith, right? Or, or maybe you just need to believe. I mean, really, believe in what? I mean, have faith in what? Faith in faith? No, because faith in itself has no intrinsic value. There has to be an object of the faith, an objective faith. You know, people talk about like, uh, place your faith in the universe, or place your faith in people, or place your faith in fate, like F-A-T-E, right? But the problem with that is these things, these people cannot really help you out. They will fail. We talked about that last time. You know, they cannot fix your sin problem. 
So it's faith in Christ Jesus. It has to be objective faith in him because he's the only one who can say it. Not just objective faith, but it also needs to be an authentic faith, a real faith. It's what Paul said in, in Romans 10, 9. If you believe in your heart, that means in the core of your being, and, and this is so important because faith doesn't mean just to acknowledge, right? Because a lot of people will say, well, I have faith that there is a God, right? I, I acknowledge that there is this supreme being in up there. <laughs> Some people would say this, up there. Um, and, and that's it for them. That's superficial acknowledgement. And James said in James 2, even the demons believe in God and they tremble. So it's not that that saves. So to believe in your heart, for lack of words, is to really, really, really believe, right? It has to be an all-in, all-out, not just superficially acknowledging and believing that Jesus is the only Savior. Now, I always love that illustration. It's a true story. In the 1800s, there's a missionary from Edinburgh, Scotland, Scotland who went over to a group of um, South Pacific Islands called the New Hebrides. Uh, it's now called Vanuatu. Um, so the, the missionary's name was John Patton. And John Patton went to the New Hebrides and he had a burden for these people that they, their lives would change. And so the people who lived in those islands were cannibals. And so John Patton's life became very interesting to say the least, to live among them. And um, he was so committed to share the gospel to this group of people that he wanted to translate the New Testament in their own language so they would understand the truth. And as he was translating, he had a problem with one word that he could not find the right equivalent in their language. And it is the word belief. It is the word for faith. It is the word for trust. He couldn't quite get the right meaning for those words. So one day, he was sitting in his hut. He invited an elder of, of the tribe. And so when the elder came in, John Patton leaned back in his chair and put his feet up. And then he said, what am I doing right now? Okay? Is there a word? Give me a word in your language that describes what this is. And as he was doing that. So the elder gave him the word that basically described what that means. And so John translated the New Testament, John 3.16, based on that translation. And it reads like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and get this, that whoever places his whole weight on him will never perish but have everlasting life. That's what it means to believe in the New Testament, to place all of your life upon, to really believe from your heart that Jesus is the Savior. So they heard a great message, they experienced the great Christ. The third trait is they exhibited great love. They exhibited great love. Look at verse four once again. So since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, look at verses seven and eight. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, look at verse 8, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So these converts in Colossae had a love for God's people. It was so great that even their pastor bragged about it to Paul. You know, and I just want to say to you guys, you're brag worthy too. You know, I, I I tell our story here and about you guys to my 
family, my friends, you know, whoever. I brag about you. Um, uh, because I realize I serve one of the most loving congregations there is around me. Um, in, in so many ways, not just financial or material things that we bless each other, but in so many different ways that we stand by each other, we pray for one another. When, when you hear someone, you know, a, a family uh, is sick, and we pray for them, or a family died, and it, it, there's so many things that, that I have experienced through the years through this church. And, and that is something that I will always be grateful for. Now, let me just put something in there. Because if you see in verse 4, love follows faith. We've heard of your faith and your love. Faith comes first. First, faith is first followed by love. Why? Because to Paul, faith is proven by love. If you have real faith, it will be demonstrated by love. Okay? Now, would you agree with this statement? Love seems pretty absent these days from the world. Right? I mean, there's not a whole lot of love out there. Jesus said the love of many in the last days will grow cold, and I think we're seeing that. Not just from the world, but from a lot of Christians as well. You know, the lack of love. In 1965, there's this singer, her name is Jackie DeShannon, and, and there was a hit, a hit song. I know that some of you have even sung that song. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. And, and, and it says there, it's the only thing that there's just to do love, right? I mean, I agree with that. There's not enough love that's out there. There's a lot of hate, but there's an absence of love. Malcolm Muggridge said, the biggest disease and greatest evil today is the lack of love. Now, one of the most notable characteristics of an unsafe person is being wrapped up in themselves. They don't think about themselves. And so one of the most notable characteristics of someone who follows Jesus is that they have a great love in return for others. Now I know even saying that, we all know of someone who claims to be a Christian but is so unloving, right? That's just a sad reality. You know, they're the kind of people that Mark Twain said, he said, he's a good man in the worst sort of way. <laughs> but we've all known people like that. But we also know that Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so it's so important that if we have faith in Jesus, we have love for one another. Why is that? Well, it's really basic. How can we ever share the gospel about God's love and we don't love? It's not going to translate, right? Um, they're going to be out the door, never to return. If, we, they, if they don't see that we love one another. And here's how that works. Because God is invisible. And um, no one has seen God, but love somehow, in some way, makes an invisible God visible. It says so in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought in full expression, is made manifest in us. And so... Love is something that should be a trait for a follower of Jesus. They experience the great gospel, they experience the great Christ, they exhibited great love. Fourth trait, they expected a great future. They expected a great future. Look at verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Now, are you noticing this triad? that Paul loves to use. Faith, 
hope, and love. He always uses those three together. He did that too in his letter to the Thessalonians, and of course we know that from 1 Corinthians 13. You know, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of this is love. It's like Paul's shorthand to describe the genuine Christian life. There are three cardinal virtues, faith, hope, and love. Sometimes he interchanges the, uh, the order of these three, but it's always faith first. Faith first, because faith produces the other two. If you have faith, you will have love for others and hope for the future, because faith um, rests on the past, love works in the present, and hope looks to the future. Remember, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you have faith in Christ in this life alone, we are of all people the most miserable. Right? But our hope, we have a greater hope that's not just in this world. You need to realize, unsaved people do not have this kind of hope. They don't. You know, the hope that they have is just right here on earth. And, and that's it. You know, that it's all they got. And if you wonder why, you know, some people are so mean, so selfish, so focused on themselves alone, it's because of that. You know, because there's nothing after this for them. They don't have anything. And so, you know, uh, they just want to live the most out of this life. Now, let me just say this. Maybe there's someone here watching. If you are an unbeliever right now, you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ yet as your Savior and Lord. Let me just say this. There's still time. And I hope you give your life to him. Because a lot of times people say, well, you know, I have the rest of my life, you know, to do that. No, you don't. Tomorrow is not promised to us. And if you, and if you still say, you know what, Jesus is not for me. I will never, ever respond to that message. And let me just say this to you. That's where you're at. I hope that you better milk the life on this earth as best you can, because this is all the this is all the fun that you'll ever get. After this life, nothing, no hope at all. Get every last drop of satisfaction, because this is it. After this life is over, it's the last good time that you will ever have. That's why I say, I am praying. I am praying and hoping that, that if you haven't done that, you, you make that decision right now, today. You put your faith in Jesus so you have that hope that we are talking about. You know, I mentioned to you that this world we live in doesn't have much hope. And it's proven by a New York research group, and they made the statement that most Americans are unhappy with their lives. So what's interesting about that finding is that they found that uh, statement to be true, that most Americans are unhappy with their lives before COVID. That's before COVID, before the pandemic. Most Americans are unhappy with their lives. Do you think it's gotten better since? Right? That, that they have more hope now? No. It's even gone down. People are filled with anxiety more than ever. You know, they're filled with fear, hopelessness, lack of confidence. According to a Gallup poll, 2021 was the most unhappy year in the world. This world is pretty desperate for hope. And we have that message of hope. And if we put our faith in Jesus, we can have that love. We can have that hope. And we close with this. The fifth trait. They exported great fruit. They exported great fruit. Look at verse 6. Which has come to you as it also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard 
and use the grace of God in truth. It's fruitful. The Christian life is not static. It's not stagnant. It's not meant to be just a system of ethics that we believe in, not just a religious ideology that we have. It is moving. It is growing. It is fruitful. The gospel produces, first of all, an inward transformation, you know, that, that love and hope and that's mentioned, but it also produces an outward benefit. That's the fruit that Paul is talking about here. It is bringing forth fruit in your life. Now, we don't exactly know what fruit Paul is referring to, but if you read the context of this section, it seems like Paul was referring to the replicating nature of the gospel message, that where, wherever it goes, it grows, it spreads. New believers are brought in. New converts are being won. It's Paul's way of saying that Christianity is spreading everywhere because of your faith, church in Colosse. That's what he's saying here. And think about this. What began as the most despised movement led by a crucified Jew in an obscure section of a despised land by the Roman government became the most dominant religious system in the Roman Empire by the 4th century AD. That is growth. That is fruit. The message was shared in different places and it spread like wildfire. They heard it. They believed it. They were changed by it. And now they're spreading it around. It has to be that. They made their faith in Jesus something that other people can experience. And that made me think, that should be a challenge for all of us. I mean, am I being fruitful for Christ? Are people being led to Jesus through my life, through my words? Because it, it's so clear here that this is an expectation, a trait for a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to close with this challenge. We are starting out our year with this week of prayer and fasting for the primary purpose of keeping first things first. And that is our relationship with Jesus. See why? Because we cannot give what we do not have. Right? I mean, if we are to share our faith in Jesus with others, then our faith must be growing. It must be real. It must be vibrant. How can people want what we have if what they see in us is not something worth wanting? So we focus not on activities, not on programs, not on outreaches, but we start here, our relationship with the one who is our Savior and Lord first. You know, in that passage we started with, mm -hmm. Jesus commended Mary, you know, who spent time with him at his feet for, put, for putting first things first. And he told Martha about it, who was busy serving Jesus. And let me just say this, serving, there's something wrong with serving Jesus. You know, Mary, Martha really wasn't doing anything wrong. It is just that her priorities are not what Jesus wanted her to have. So, what we have with us is an opportunity to learn what Martha learned. So, let's embrace that purpose, that process. And, and I hope that, you know, I'll talk about our devotional after this, but I hope you will not allow the devotional you need to do. Just slow it down and really ask the Holy Spirit speak to me and allow that word to do its work in your life. You know, and, and I pray that next Sunday. I will ask for testimonies, but what you have learned, what, what God has done and is doing in your life as a, as a product of our week of prayer and fasting.
we will be having four gatherings this week for prayer. Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday. Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday. All nights of prayer. And this is really to help us focus on what God wants us to focus on. Putting first things first. And I hope that would be your prayer. I hope that would be, Lord, teach me. Teach me how to, to prioritize what truly matters in my life as you would want. Not what I want in my life, but what you want. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Thank you, thank you, Pastor uh, Rico. Maraming maraming salamat po once again, mga patid, sa magandang paalala sa atin, especially ngayon taon na ito, 2023. Alam niyo po, ika nga ni Pastor Rico, at the end of this week, March 31 na po, sa Biernes, March 31, we are ending the first quarter of 2023. Ang bilis ng panahon kung isipin natin, ano? Isipin din po lang, mga patid, ang katotohanan na ang Panginoon ay gumagaman ang pinidaan the first three months, Alam natin na, na lahat ng yan ay kalooban ng Panginoon. At hinayaan niya yung mangyari for a reason, for a purpose. Ngayon ang tanong, katuloy ni Pastor Rico, how does that build our faith up? How does that build our faith up? We want to praise God, mga kapatid. Sa buhay natin, sa maintain buhay natin, we want to thank the Lord for what He's done, what He's about to do. So if you're watching right now, and you want to open your heart to Jesus, remember what John chapter 3, verse 16 says, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, let, let's pray this prayer, and I pray that you will pray this prayer also, Mahapatid. In your heart, you say, Lord, I thank You for my life. I understand that You died for our sins, buried and resurrected. I want to surrender my life to You. I'm making that decision in Jesus' name. Amen. Idagdag pa natin yan, Lord, I repent of my sins. Diba? Sabihin natin, Lord, I repent of my sins. That is, we want to not go back to repent of my sins. No, we want to go back to our sins. Lahat ng yan, mga patid, pinatawad na Panginoon. So I pray that each one of us will make that decision. Even this morning, wherever you're from, we have people from, uh, I think this... Uh, viewer is from um seems like uh, from spain or for it's just, uh, spanish speaking god bless you at the mercy gamut always watching us good evening pastor rico and uh pastor real tika thank you pastor armand velasco hey jackie tika mariano ruth come again from saskatchewan uh canada god bless you as you listen to you also we always listen at the yuli lubis and i pray that tomorrow what a wednesday with stephen domingo and myself and tomorrow night day number three of pastor rico gutierrez's preaching uh series on colossians chapter one marami salamat for watching and always remember every moment and every day one two three be happy stay healthy Be holy, stay handsome and pretty. Pagpalagi ng Panginoon, magkita na tayo bukas ng umaga for What a Wednesday and tomorrow night, day number three for Pastor Rico Gutierrez's uh, day number three message on, on Colossians chapter one. God bless you, Mga Kutid. We will see you again. Trade your sorrows to joy.